In this video, I'll demonstrate how to create a logo that's simple, clean, and effective. Along the way, we'll use many of CorelDRAW's standard tools and features, and learn some shortcuts. Before we get started, if you're watching this video on YouTube, you'll find a link in the description below that will take you to our tutorial page on Corel's Discovery Center. Here you can also download a written copy of this tutorial. I'm in a new CorelDRAW document whose units are in inches. If you use different units but want to switch to inches to follow along, double click on one of the rulers. This opens the ruler options where you can change your units. The background for the logo will be based on a circle, so I'll activate the ellipse tool whose shortcut is F7. When I click and drag, I can create an ellipse, but as I can see here in the status bar, pressing Ctrl constrains the ellipse to a circle. I'll create the circle using a random size, and once finished, it automatically becomes selected. I want the circle to have an exact size, and the first few fields in the interactive property bar are where I can set location, size, and scale. Because the lock ratio is on, any changes I make will maintain the aspect ratio of this ellipse. In other words, it will remain a circle. I'll type 3 inches for the horizontal size, press Enter, and both values update. Next, I want to start on the rays of the sun, which will be created by making a rotated array of lines. To start the first line, I'll use the Freehand tool, whose shortcut is F5. This tool can make freehand curvy lines, but again, I can peek down here to see what the control key will do. In this case, it constrains the line to be straight. I'll click once outside the circle here to start, press and hold control, and now the line is straight and constrained to specific angles. I'll click here to make it horizontal and long enough to cut across the circle. Now I want to move the line so that it passes through the center of the circle. I'll tap the space bar to activate the pick tool, and with shift pressed, I'll add the circle to what's currently selected. A new addition to CorelDRAW 2019 is the Align and Distribute Docker, where I can find the options I need. These options can also be found in the Object, Align and Distribute menu, where I can see the shortcuts as well. In the Docker, I'll click Align Center Vertically, and the shortcut for this is E. I also want to center horizontally, so I can click here or press the C shortcut and I'll click in blank space to deselect everything. To get the ray pattern, I want to make rotated copies of this line. But if I duplicate the line now, the new line will be offset from the existing line, a quarter inch both horizontally and vertically. Because I want the new line to sit exactly on top of the existing one, I'll change both of these duplicate distances to zero. The objects docker is where I can see what I have so far, one ellipse and one curve. The pick tool is still active, and I'll select the line. Then I'll press Ctrl D to duplicate it. It looks like nothing's happened because the copy was made in place, but in the docker there are now two curves. This new line will be the first rotated copy. I'll enter 12 degrees in the angle of rotation field. Now I'll take advantage of CorelDRAW's Smart Duplicate feature, which creates additional copies that use the previous transformation which is the 12 degree rotation in this case. I'll press Ctrl D repeatedly, 13 times to be exact, to create new copies with the same rotation. Now I can start filling in the rays. The Smart Fill tool is perfect for this, since it fills within the boundaries of closed areas. In the interactive property bar, I want to specify the fill color, and I'll choose a sunny yellow. I don't want any visible outlines in the final product, so I'll choose No Outline. I'll zoom in and click inside alternating shapes, and here are the new yellow curves in the object's docker. Now that the rays are complete, I no longer need the lines. To select what I want to remove, I'll go back to the pick tool by tapping the spacebar. While holding the Alt key and dragging a marquee selection window, I can select everything that is inside or touching the marquee window. Pressing Delete removes all of the lines, and for the last horizontal line, I'll select and delete. So that the rays will act as a single object from now on, I'll select them all and either click the Group icon, or press Ctrl G, or use the Group option from the Context menu. And I can see the group of eight objects in the Docker. I can use the Rename option in the Objects Context menu to change the group name to Sunrays. 
The next task for this logo is to create a lighthouse, which is comprised of three rectangles. I'll click the Rectangle tool and click and drag for a rectangle that looks about the right size. But I want the size to be exact, so I'll enter 1 half inch for the horizontal size and turn off the aspect ratio lock. Now I can change the vertical size to 1 and a quarter inch and press Enter. Of course, the rectangle isn't located correctly, so I'll activate Pick, press Shift and add the group of rays, and press C to align horizontally. Then I'll press B to align bottoms. I need two more rectangles, so I'll press F6 to activate the Rectangle tool. I want to start at the top left corner of the existing rectangle, but I can't find that point because my snaps are off. This can be changed by choosing View, Snap Off to toggle snaps on, or I can press Alt Q. I'll start at this node and drag to almost the other side. Once the rectangle is complete, I can resize it to meet the other node. The third rectangle will become the light of the lighthouse. I'll draw it in blank space, pressing Ctrl to keep it a square. To resize this time, I want the lock on so that my new horizontal dimension of a quarter inch will be used for vertical as well. To place this rectangle, I want alignment guides to help me see where to go. So in the view menu, I'll turn on alignment guides. Now I can grab this rectangle by its center to move it and use the guides to place it atop the second rectangle, perfectly centered. To fill these rectangles, I'll go back to the pick tool, select the bottom and middle ones, and left click the white swatch to fill them both. I'll select the top rectangle and fill it with red. The middle rectangle has the shape I want, but I want to make changes to the top and bottom ones. Starting with the bottom, I'll right click on it and choose Convert to Curves, a popular tool whose shortcut is Control Q. Using the Shape tool, whose shortcut is F10, on a curve, presents several nodes that can be edited in a variety of ways. For this bottom rectangle, I want to taper toward the top, so I'll drag the top left node to this intersection point, then do the same for the top right corner. For the top rectangle, which is now selected, I can leave it as a rectangle. The interactive property bar has corner radius fields, and I need to keep this lock turned off so that all four corners don't change together. This field rounds the top left corner, and I'll click the up arrow until I get the rounding I want stopping at 0.2 inches. I'll enter the same value for the top right corner. The lighthouse needs a door at the bottom, and I'll base the door on the light shape. The shape is still selected, and I'll use Control D to duplicate this rectangle in place, then fill it with black. The door should be longer vertically, let's say 50% longer. I don't need to take out my calculator and enter a new vertical dimension. Instead, I can use a scale value. The current scale values are not 100% because the original top rectangle was resized after it was first created in blank space. But I can convert the shape to a curve, which resets the scales to 100%. After turning the lock off, I can now change the vertical scale directly to 150, or I can just add 50 to the 100 that's already there. I'll add the bottom rectangle to what's selected and use B to align bottoms. We've seen that left-clicking a color swatch applies a fill, and right-clicking changes an outline. To remove the lighthouse outlines, I'll select all four shapes and right-click on the No Fill swatch. All that's left to add is the company name for this logo. The text tool is here, or I can press F8. I'll click to start at the left border of the logo and start typing. To change the font, I'll select the text and open the font list in the interactive property bar. I can scroll down to see my text in each font, but say I know I want to use the font called Cooper. I'll start typing the name Cooper to jump to it in the list and click to apply. To match the font color to the red I used for the light, I'll find the swatch in my document color palette at the bottom of the screen and left click this red to fill the text. The last step is making the text the same width as the sun rays. If I select the text, then use this sizing handle to line up the right sides, the text will become distorted. This doesn't look too bad, but let's say I want to keep the text at the same proportions. I'll use Ctrl Z to undo. I'll select the group of rays to note its width of 3 inches. I can then select the text, keep the ratio locked, and apply the same width to the text. 
Now I just have to center align the text with the rays. Now that we've completed our logo, it's time to save it. To keep it in Corel Draw format, I would choose File, Save As, and choose CDR. For other formats, such as PNG for a web graphic, I would use File Export. Here I also have EPS and AI formats, which enable easy resizing, as well as a host of other formats. This brings us to the end of this tutorial on creating a logo in Corel Draw. If you've been watching this video on YouTube, you'll find a link in the description below that will take you to our tutorial page on Corel's Discovery Center. Here you can also download a written copy of this tutorial.